أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله ثم الصلاة والسلام على رسول الله صلى الله عليه وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين the head teacher the deputy head teacher the entire administration and staff of Chiburi Secondary School, students on school practice, ladies and gentlemen, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. I want first of all to take this opportunity to thank the Almighty Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for the numerous blessings that he usually bestows upon us. We are so grateful to Allah for each and every blessing. And our prayer is that we use those blessings in the best way that uh, he wants and he loves. Some time back, some time back, I had a special visit with the head teacher and the deputy of this school. And at the end of our discussion, a resolution was made to come here and share with you some of the important areas that I don't want to say a Muslim should know, but a human being should be aware of in his or her lifetime. That is the concept of will. Much as in my presentation, I can as well address the legal perspective because of my modest background in law. But the much concentration shall be on the Islamic perspective. People did not, we didn't introduce. Before I could start, I am Walusimbi Abdul Hafiz Musa. the director of Sharia and legal affairs in the office of the Supreme Mufti. At the same time, I'm a lecturer at Makerere University in the Department of Religion and Peace Studies. I'm also heading the Department of Sharia at Islamic University in Uganda. My academic journey has been long and this being an academic institution, I think it's important to share before I could go into my presentation. I started my primary school in Chiinda Muslim Primary School in Mitiana. From there I joined Bilal Islamic Institute for my O and A level. I joined the Islamic University in Uganda for my bachelor's and master's degree in Sharia. Then I joined the International Islamic University Islamabad in Pakistan for my PhD in Sharia still. I am also a good student of other specializations. For instance, I hold a master's degree in project management. I hold a diploma in corporate law. I hold a diploma in law from LDC and I'm also a teacher by profession because I have a diploma in education. That is Abdul Hafiz before you. The concept of will, just like the way how the head teacher has introduced it, 
it is somehow becoming a scarecrow. Many of us, we actually don't want even to speak about it. But at the same time, it is a reality of life. And because of this, I want to share with you some of the few slides that I felt that they're important for us to understand. From the introduction, I wish to share with you what you know about the power of expression. The power of expression, it is the cardinal distinguishing character of humans. That is why for us who studied writing from the right, when you are told to define a human being, you say al hayawan al -nadik. It is an animal that has the power of speech. So this is about expression. Further still, expression gives you an opportunity to transfer what you conceal in your mind what you conceal in your chest or your breast to be known. That is why the scholars of Arabic literature who are here will confirm with me that one scholar said, Innamal kalamu la fil fuad. Whatever we want to communicate is within here. But the tongue has been made as a tool of disseminating what we have here. So it is until when you express yourself, that's when we shall know that, oh, this is what you have been holding in your mind. This is what you have been holding in your chest. So that is the power of expression. Expression is also powerful in such a way that it is a fundamental human right, as you all know. And that is why in many situations, when you are denied your right to express yourself, that one has led to conflict. In other situations, it has led to revolutions. We are always found in such situations like why do they stop us from talking? Let them allow us to say whatever we want because we all trust that power of expression. Finally, that power of expression ordinarily subsists as long as we are alive. One of the indicators that your life has come to an end is because you can no longer express yourself in the best way. And that is why yesterday, for those of you who were with us mourning or giving the last respect to al Hajj Hussein Chanjo, when he lost that power, at an earlier stage, before death, he had to fight for it. So much so that during the last 10 or 13 years, he has been expressing himself by charging a battery. So this should actually send a strong message to you that you can express yourself without necessarily charging somewhere. How best have you used that power of expression? Having said that, this takes me to the significance of a will. A will is held sacred. The students of law are always told that this is the last wishes of the deceased. And that's why you cannot tamper with it, except under some provisions and circumstances that are provided by the law. So this is how strong it is. When we talk about a will, we are talking about the communication for the permanently impaired. You can no longer come back and make your orders. As we talk now, you have the right, you have the freedom. 
Everything is at your exposal, or sorry, disposal, to tell us what do you want us to do when you can no longer communicate to us. The Baganda have a saying that So as long as you are not around, people will say anything, people will disseminate anything from you, yet you cannot come back to defend yourself or to correct the situation. The will is so significant in such a way that just imagine a situation where you were away. Maybe we are for Hajj. Did things move on the way that you liked them? When you were sent, maybe on a leave, did things move on the way that you wanted? When, for instance, you delegated, that's why in administration, we actually don't welcome so much any person in acting capacity. Because someone in acting capacity is actually in acting capacity. So the will comes from such a perspective that you, you, you are no longer around to tell people what you actually wish them to implement. And from the Islamic perspective, we are told that whatever that goes on after Death, you are actually aware. You are somewhere silent, incapacitated permanently, and you wish you could come back and say, please do this, but you cannot. And that is the relevance of uh, the will. I also wanted to share with you a situation that try to fake a situation that you are dead. Try to go missing and let news spread around that so and so is dead then resurface, that is when you will actually know the importance and significance of a will. I have a scenario to share with you of a person who had a hearing impairment. He couldn't listen, he couldn't hear. So for quite a long time, he was known that this person, is he described as a dumb? He's dumb, he can't hear. Deaf, thank you so much. He's deaf. So what happened is that people around him could actually conspire against him. After all, he cannot hear. Now, a certain specialist came in town, and what this man did is to go secretly so that he can go and seek medical attention and treatment. And good enough, he got it right. But the doctor advised him that please don't reveal to people that now you have regained your hearing capacity. So he went back as a deaf. Now whatever people they are saying this time, he was grasping and listening. And after having heard what they were saying in front of him, some of them even wearing smiles, he went back and changed his will. He knew individuals. He knew people. So, before that situation comes to you, here is an opportunity for you to communicate what you wish others to do. That is why from the Islamic perspective, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in Quran chapter 5 verse 106 has commanded us, كُتِبَ عَلَيْكُمْ إِذَا حَضَرَ أَحَدَكُمُ الْمَوْتِ إِنْ تَرَكَ خَيْرًا Allah has made it obligatory on you when you know that death is approaching you, please make a will. But how many of us know when death shall actually approach us? So it means that in this situation when you are okay, that is when actually you should sit down. If it necessitates, get a retreat and then jot down, write down, document what you feel that others should implement after your demise. In the hadith narrated by Abdullah bin Umar, it is not allowed for a human being to sleep or to spend two nights except when your will is just under your pillow. That is how significant it is from the Islamic perspective. So from the experience, at the end of my presentation, I will share with you some of the live experiences. But from experience, my office is also involved in distributing the estate of the deceased according to Sharia. 
But wallahi, I can tell you, if you don't make your will, you shall be the one to be blamed. Because we happen to be in situations whereby we don't have any guiding document. The relatives come in with different selfish interests, but nobody can stop them. The only person who could have stopped them, it is you, but you just took it like that, and now everyone can come and claim. So from experience, if you die without a will, you shall be the person to be blamed. Types of a will. There are two main types. Number one is the monetary. And this is, by the way, what takes most of our time when we, think, we tell the young generation, like the many beautiful faces I see here, do you have a will? He says, I'm still young. So what? I don't have anything to put in a will. So our concentration is always on, I don't have wealth. But the will is categorized into the monetary. That is where you want to transfer ownership or usufruct or beneficiary benefit of a certain wealth to someone. But we also have the non-monetary. This is about the delegation of responsibilities. Delegation of responsibilities is so much, uh, is, is, is so much of our concern because as I've told you, many people are concentrating about the first. Yet actually, the second is the engine. It is the mover, it is the shaker. Funeral arrangements, I can, I, I can say with confidence that within this audience, you have ever heard about scenarios where people are fighting about where to take a dead body for burial. So why do you want to leave that kind of conflict and unnecessary chaos around yourself? Just of recent, you know that Lady Justice Arachi spent almost a week and it was about the burial ground. I don't know whether there was a guiding document, but the matter reached the courts of law until the court had to decide. The new husband is saying that because of the strong relationship between me and her, this lady should be buried on my side. The family members are saying that no, we have a lot of memories we want to attach to our mother, so she should be buried here. So you could see that kind. From the Muslim fraternity, it is even worse. We have seen situations whereby people are stealing the dead body. So why do you want to leave such situations, such a chaos, which is unnecessary when you have the opportunity now? Another issue here is that, why do you want us to listen to the spirits? Seriously speaking? Someone comes and gets possessed, he starts shouting, then delving into the ground. Hey, I am the one. I'm Seka Hussein. Subhanallah. Why do you want to leave such a situation that it is your spirits that should communicate to us what you wanted? Another situation here, I'm actually emphasizing the issue of funeral arrangements. You know very well that there are those families, especially where the minors are orphans, whereby the relatives have you know, intervened in the matter, and they have denied these people their rights, including access to property. Whenever they raise their heads that we want our land, they say, you are still young. Why? It is your problem. It is your mistake. The other problem is on the execution of the will. And we shall see in the practical pre pre preparation of the will that you must have an executor. The person whom, in whom you have vested the right to implement your will. It can be one person, it can be more than one person. The executors now are becoming also another problem. That is why you must also define their powers, their responsibilities, their mandate. Where does it start from? Where does it end? Those of you from the Buganda culture, you know that Omusika, in most cases, he turns to be like a father. So when the sisters come demanding that we want our rights, say, 
this is because you didn't do what you were supposed to do. Having said that, these are time bombs. From experience, from my field study, if you happen to be in any of these scenarios and you have not made your will, I'm telling you, you are sitting on a time bomb. It is soon exploding. Number one, if you have ever had a certain status and you now have a new status and you have no will, what do I mean? You were a Muslim, you are a non-Muslim, you are now a Muslim. You have a big family of Christians. You have a big family of any people of other faith. But you are now in another faith. You have not lost contact with them because as a matter of fact, they have the legal basis to claim for you because of the blood relationship. So it is your will actually to guide us. How are we going to relate with them and how are we going to relate with you in the new faith? If you are coming from a background like mine, actually, my grandfather is the Islam starts with my grandfather, meaning that the grand grand are not Muslims. That is why in the spirit of tolerance, when you go to our burial grounds, we have a part for Christians, we have others for Muslims. So, if you don't make a will, there might be some kind of chaos. Where do you belong? If you have ever changed status, you were married before, and now you were divorced. You know many scenarios whereby the man has died, and he had already separated with a certain wife, but a woman comes out and says, and claims, he has been my husband. After all, Allah has made the marital relationship sacred and sacred. Sometimes we divorce during day and at night we are married. So it is only the will that comes out to tell me that it is over, it is over. So that someone cannot come and claim after you have actually made your position very clear on this. Another one is, if you happen to be in multiple marriages, I want to start with my side, men who are polygamous. Don't take this matter for granted. As long as you are around as a family head, you can back and people will say, Sama and Wathwaan, we have, we have adhered. Your order is one, order ni moja. Nobody can challenge you. But after death, it cannot be. You know that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has allowed us as men to marry more than one. But the situation is not going to be as simple as you think after your demise. That's why you are, your will must be clear. I have come across a certain situation whereby the first family, the man passed on, leaving behind two wives, and each wife has children. The first family has actually been there at the time when the man was toiling to amass this wealth. And after the death, they denied any right, any property to the second family, saying that they were not there. <laughs> Seriously speaking, they just jumped over the bus at City Square, you know that language. So, it is your will that should guide and it should be your will that should act as evidence for such a family to come out and claim. If you don't do this, you are responsible. <coughs> Another situation is, if at all, you know, from the side of uh, women, whereby you have had a certain previous marriage and you are now in a new marriage, you must have a will that clearly states what is your status now. Another time bomb that is so serious, and it is a reality, we must speak about it boldly, the challenge of illegitimate children, especially for men. For women, somewhere they are, they are safe. Because an illegitimate child inherits legally from the mother. 
But from the Islamic perspective, an illegitimate child is not entitled to your wealth as a, as a father. So you must tell us, how do you want us to deal with that illegitimate child? Just burying your head in the sand, breathing the rare part outside, is not solving any problem. So please write your will. And that's why, inshallah, at the end of the presentation, we have some samples which we produced as the directorate to guide you. Write somewhere that I have A, B, C, D, but you cannot explain them. They are not illegitimate. And you can guide us how to deal with them. If you don't do that, in this era of DNA, you will see a long tube. No, no, mwana wa mgenzi. No, no, mwana wa mgenzi. So you are burdening us to take them to Wandegea so that we can confirm whether or not these are your biological children. So if you have one, please, it is time up. If at all, as a Muslim, you have a non-Muslim legal hair, this is by experience. You know, as a matter of reality, a Muslim is married to a Christian. I know some of you who follow up my presentations, I have ever made a position on that from the Islamic perspective. But the reality is, we have families whereby the husband is a Muslim, the wife is a non-Muslim. And you know that there is a law in Islam which bars or impedes a non-Muslim from taking from the property of a Muslim. But you are also reluctant about making a will. Some of your children, maybe, are not of the same faith with you. Some of other relatives, the father, the mother. So, if you happen to be under that scenario, please make a will. Another one is reservations of some property. I had just published an article on matrimonial property from the Islamic perspective. The legal perspective has its own treatment of matrimonial home. And what is matrimonial home anyway? In many cases, from the legal perspective, if I die as a husband, the matrimonial home devolves to the wife automatically because she's the surviving spouse. From the same perspective, it might not be the same. We have seen situations whereby relatives come and they want to chase out the widow. So if you feel that your matrimonial home should stay there preserved and reserved, why don't you help us so that you can put it into your will? Some of the properties that you don't want to be distributed, or you have made some dedications, we call them work endowment. I have given this piece of land for the benefit of a mosque, for the benefit of a school, for the benefit of the disabled. All this must be in a, a will. Finally, you know that the reality is we belong to certain sects. I'm now talking about the Muslim family. Sheikh Sentamu might be actually subscribing to the Salafi movement in Uganda. Salafia, Jamaiya to Dawa, Salafia. I might be subscribing, actually, I'm subscribing to the Chibuli Office of the Supreme Mufti. Others might be subscribing to Uganda Muslim Supreme Council. The matter is not a matter of legitimacy. The fact is, we are living with this reality. And we have seen situations, I have ever been at a certain barrier in eastern Uganda, whereby sex are about to exchange blows because of the deceased. By the fact that this deceased is found in eastern Uganda, this is a stronghold of Uganda Muslim Supreme Council. But at the same time, the deceased was belonging to the Kibbutz sect. So it is the will that should save us from all of that. Once again, I have to say that if you happen to be in this and you don't have a will, my dear brother, my dear sister, you are just sitting on a time bomb. It is time to actually make your will. In case of a monetary will, because this is our major interest, in Islam, by the way, we don't have a right to distribute the property. 
That one should be a landmark statement. I always tell my students that the best you can do for us is to die. That is what we require from you, just to die. But delving into the matters that I want this plot to go to Muchara Mugole, this one to Muchara Mukuru, please save us. That is not yours. Quran has given us the clear way of distributing it. But in case you want to make any dedication that is financial or monetary, please mind about this. One, don't make a will to the benefit or don't dedicate it to the benefit of a legal heir. In Islam, you don't dedicate a monetary will to a legal heir. In other words, the circles, we can limit it. Don't make a will. Don't say that this car, when I die, this car is for my child because it's a legal heir. Don't say that this plot of land is for my wife. Your wife is a legal heir. Allah has catered for her. Don't say that it belongs to my father or to my mother. All those categories are catered for. And there is a clear hadith about it. Inna Allah kat a'afwa kulla di haqqin haqqahu fala wasuyata liwarith. Allah has given each legal heir his or her right, so don't beg a monetary will towards them or in their benefit. What is the rationale? The rationale is we want to preserve the family cohesion. How do you feel when your father dies? And after opening the will, you find out that your brother Abdul Swabur has been given five acres of land and for you are not given. That is when the intrigue, that's when the conflict starts. So Islam has said that please leave it as it is. But it doesn't mean that Islam closes the door for appreciating your relatives who have done good for you. You know even our service to our parents is not at the, same, uh, at the same level. I might have been so dutiful to my father. I might have rendered a lot of service to my father. Islam has given the father a right of freedom to give you during your, his lifetime. It is allowed. And that's why from the language of law, you can go to the lawyer so that you can draft what we call a gift deed. And you show clearly that in your lifetime, when you are sober, when you are sane, when you are mature, you have given this to so and so among these relatives. If you don't do that, for us we shall not honor it in Sharia. And by the way, when you are doing it, the principles of justice and fairness must be the governing principles. Otherwise, you would like all your children to pray for you after your demise. So why don't you also be fair and honest to all of them? The second restriction is not beyond a third. In other words, I'm not allowed to give any monetary benefit to my close relatives who are legal heirs. Except, by the way, let me also make this clear. If at all we open your will and we find out that you have given your child Abbas this, we are not going to cancel it there and then. We shall have a meeting for all the legal heirs and we ask them. If they consent and they approve, we shall implement and execute it. If they say no, that one shall be retrieved back to the distributable property. But if I am to dedicate to a person who is not related to me. Let me give an example of my brother, Sheikh Sentamu. I am allowed as Abdul Hafiz because there is not among my legal heirs. I'm allowed to say that I am dedicating one acre of land to him, but that one shouldn't exceed a third of my entire property. So we must ask, what is the, the value of the entire estate? When we find out that it is within the third, we shall execute it. If it is beyond, we shall reduce it to be within the limits of the third. Then number three is, 
It shouldn't be dedicated to the benefit of unlawful gains. We are not allowed to say that I'm dedicating this for the construction of the cinema, a construction of the discotheque, do this and that, according to Islam. What are the essentials? As I'm actually winding up, because I prefer to use little time so that I can allow time for questions and answers. A legal will in Islamic law starts with the formation and when we talk about formation, we talk about offer and acceptance. These statements must, must be clear. The contracting, cap uh, the con uh, contracting parties, those ones, we are looking at the testator, that is yourself, whereby you must be having the legal capacity, you are legally competent, <coughs> you are mature, you are sane, you are doing this not under influence or under undue, uh, undue influence. You are not under duress, among others. But if at all you are dedicating it to the benefit of someone, that someone is known as the legatee. And the legatee must be having the legal capacity to own. He must be known by description. You describe that I'm giving this to so and so and not in any way contributed to the death of uh, the testator. <laughs> in other words, if any person contributes to the death or the demise or the killing of the person who made a will, and we find out that he had dedicated something to him, we shall cancel it. Finally, not among those who are entitled, and I had already talked about it, Another element is the subject matter. What are you willing? The subject matter or a service bequest, it should be fully owned by the testator. Please don't dedicate what you don't fully own. <coughs> Number two is that it should be valuable, it should be lawful, it should have a permissible benefit, and then that's why items which are prohibited by Islam, such as alcohol and so on, are not allowed. In practice, this is our final slide. You are now set to write your will. The following are the elements. Number one is a preamble. Make it as precise as possible. Start by expressing your gratitude to Allah for the blessing of life he has given you. You should also confirm your faith who are you? And that is why we are advised by some scholars that you start with the proclamation of shahada. Ashhadu an la ilaha illallah wa anna muhammadan rasulullah. You confirm that you are a Muslim. Then after that you can also have a simple advice for the family. I implore you to do this and that. The second is personal information. In the pamphlet that we have, we have that provision. Tell us about you, your names, your faith, <coughs> your parents' names, your date of birth, the need now, the residence, among others. Another element is the legal hair details. And this is one of the most important gaps that you must fill. You must tell us, who are your wives? Who are your children? Both the legitimate and the illegitimate. <coughs> Especially when it comes to feeling your spouses, that is you as the husband or as the father. We have seen situations, actually I have two pending cases now in my Sharia court, whereby the first wife is insisting that as far as I know, my husband was only having me as a wife. So I don't accept it to share anything with another one. If she claims that she's a legal wife to the deceased, let her produce evidence. Only to find out that her nikah was bad last year. You know, it was attended by some few sheikhs around a certain corner. And alhamdulillah, the nikah itself is valid according to Islam. Because formality in Islam is not, and it's not necessary. But this poor wife cannot actually prove to me who is distributing the property that she's a legal wife. 
That is why that information should be provided. So we talk about the husband, the children, among others. These days, the law requires that we must also give a portion to dependents or dependents. Those people who have been under your support, but they are not related to you. In Sharia, we have an accommodation to them. We give them, even though actually they are not legally entitled. So please, let us know them. I have ever been distributing a certain property, and we had a list of more than 10 independents. All of them saying, When you look at some of them, actually, they are well off. But because, as you know, that when you die, all people would like to exploit that situation. Another element is burial details. I have already emphasized about this. Your burial place, the names of the people whom you want to take care of you, those ones who are going to actually take care of washing your body, doing this and that, and so on, then the estate details. The estate details. What do you possess? At least to the mark, the minimum, each one of us possess something. At least you have the clothes that we are putting on. Please write them down. Because sometimes you know that we are living in a scenario of borrowing. You might have been putting on a suit for quite a long time, but you actually borrowed it and you forgot to return it to the owner. So after death, some of the legal heirs are actually thinking that this suit belongs to them. So please put down all those estate details. In our form, you fill in the cash. Whether it is at hand or it is in the bank, the movable and immovable property, the shares, and so on and so forth. Number six is the executor. Who is that person that you want to lead others to implement your will? If you die in tested, because in law there are two situations. You either die tested or you die in tested. You die tested because you have left behind a will. And in that case, you have indicated that there is an executor. And that's why you shall just have to process the letters of administration or the letters of probate. And after that, the office of the administrator general will just confirm that this is the executor. But if you die in tested, then the legal heirs will have to make a meeting and select amongst them who is going to be the executor. And you know there is also a lot of conflict and dispute around that. So, block that one when it is still early. Then, the scope, I have already talked about it. Some trusts, some of us, or some of you up to now, you are still, mashallah, honest. People have kept their valuables with you. Please declare them so that you don't leave unnecessary battles and wars because a certain land title of 10 acres is found in your custody and your children actually feel that it is only that the other person has not given them the transfer forms. So the trust must be declared, the property that is kept in your custody but not belonging to you, the debts and loans. What you contracted, in other words, write your debtors, write your creditors so that you don't create room for people who come and say that and he doesn't have any proof to that. The only evidence is himself and the way how he's actually justifying. He goes to an extent of cursing, but at the same time, but sincerely speaking, he's not demanding anything from the deceased. So please do that. Some of the donations, donations in respect of charitable organizations, among others. Customary hair. You know, in our traditions, we have that person who would like actually to take on the flag from you, the flag bearer. You need also to identify that person. Then, as we all know, a will cannot be valid without witnesses. 
So you must have witnesses and they must be two. Then a special message. At the end of your will, you should have a special message whereby you are actually imploring your family to be conscious of Allah, to obey the executors among others. And then finally, please don't forget to append your signature. Having said that, this is the last slide. Custody and opening. Make at least three copies of the will. Choose trusted people and inform some of your confident relatives about the custodian to avoid hiding for interests. You know situations we have been in whereby we are looking for the will but we cannot get it because someone is actually hiding it because of his or her selfish interests. And by the way, it is important that you keep it in the custody of those whom you trust because we are not allowed to open the will before your death. But some people who are not reliable, he or she will sit somewhere in the corner and open it. When he or she finds out that you did dedicate anything to him or her, he's going to conceal it, he's going to hide it. So it's important to inform some people. Then, emphasize opening at a session immediately after death. I have seen this several times. And even this is what took place yesterday as we are burying al Hajj Hussein Janjo. al Hajj Hussein has dedicated, has made a will that Sheikh Kakoza should lead his janaza, his funeral prayer. But Sheikh Kakoza was not aware. By the time we called him, we are in Tuma, and Sheikh Kakoza said, I wish I had known because this is amana, this is responsibility. I could hear the voice from him feeling so bad. That is why the moment someone is declared dead, a session should be conducted whereby we open it. You know, I have another scenario is whereby someone kept his will with me. And the moment he was declared dead, I was called in the morning. And then the session which was conducted after opening it, he told me that we know that you have a copy, but please hurry up because you also have the responsibility within a will. So that is how important it is. Our role as the Directorate of Sharia and in which capacity as I appear to you. One, we happen to help to process formal marriage and divorce certificates. And this is so important and connected to the will. If you want to prove that this is my wife, or this is my husband, these days you must have a formal certificate. And that certificate is actually validated, certified by the URSB. We do that so that there is no any doubt about your relationship with the deceased. At the same time, if you have separated with a certain spouse, please come for a formal process and procedure and you process your divorce certificate. You know of recent whereby we had a will and the will was lacking some of the elements and a woman came out and claimed and said that no, he was still my husband. So please don't take things for granted. Just come out clearly, follow the procedure. We shall hold a hearing, we shall call that person. After that, we shall write a judgment and that judgment shall actually be supported by a certificate and your status shall be very clear. Another element is, please provide copies of wills at, uh, sorry, we provide copies of a will at a cheap cost. My secretary should be around. We have a format whereby you just fill in. When the head teacher visited me, he took some three copies. Why not grab one? So that at least you can, you know, familiarize yourself with just filling in the information that you need. The copies are in Luganda and they are in English version. Then we also provide validation and certification services. Some people make wills which are actually not in conformity with the laws of the land and Sharia. Please walk into our office, give me a call, we have a session so that we can read statement by statement, we validate it, we certify it, 
and alhamdulillah you know that no one can challenge your will. Then distribute the estate according to Sharia. In case someone dies, our role as the Sharia Directorate is to distribute that according to Sharia. And alhamdulillah we are happy that we have started the system. And the system now is, being, is gaining trust from time and again. You know, we have been given the opportunity amidst challenges to distribute a state of the late Haji Musa Katongole. And you know how big he was. I understand you must have seen some things in the newspapers, but I can assure you that our work was rated at 98% because we only had one climate, only one dispute. Can you imagine a person like Katongole? When you register, it is only one person that has gone to court. Seriously, it is a success. And as I speak now, alhamdulillah, the late Haji Musa Sewafa, the one of the Sapporo schools, we are now embarking on the same work. Actually, last week I was inspecting all the property and it is our next assignment. So please, our appeal is, entrust us for all what I have talked about. I want to end it at this point, thanking you so much for the attention. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.